Hey everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about a topic in AI that's super hot, super trending, um, which is prompting. And so some of you all may remember back to T5, a paper called The Limits of Transfer Learning. And this was an encoder-decoder transformer model that aimed to frame every task as a text prediction task. Um, and so we would say translate English to German, that is good um, to do translation, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and so kind of no matter what your task is, you could frame it as a text input and a text output. Um, so the idea of framing everything as a text prediction task um, using an enormous large language model uh, like GPT-3 has gained a lot of popularity in recent years. Um, so in a review for um, ACM computing surveys um, that was recently published, the authors argue that there have been two uh, what they call C changes in NLP, essentially the transformer language model revolution in which uh, large transformer language models are pre-trained and then you fine tune them to your downstream task by changing the objective. Um, and what they call the current pre-train prompt and predict revolution. So instead of taking a pre-trained language model and adapting it to your downstream task via fine tuning, the downstream task is reformulated to look more like those solved during the language model pre-training by giving the large pre-trained language model an appropriate prompt. Um, and so this is a chart from that review article about NLP paradigms. Um, and so fully supervised learning without neural networks, we didn't even really talk about that in this course, uh, fully supervised learning uh, with the neural network. Um, so something like, you know, training an RNN from scratch. We might have talked a little bit about that. We spent most of the course talking about pre-train and then fine tune. So you use a pre-trained large language model like Roberta, um, et cetera and then you fine tune it to your downstream task, classification task, et cetera. Um, and then kind of the fourth paradigm, pre-train, prompt, and predict, where you do not touch the parameters of the large language model. It is frozen, uh, but you give it a prompt um, that has been appropriately uh, designed to perform your downstream task. So for sentiment classification, and again, kind of these are general examples drawn from this review, but that are kind of you know very um, very popular examples. Uh, fill in the blank with an emotion bearing word. My paper got a poor grade. I felt so, and then you ask the language model to fill in that blank. Translation. Fill in the blank with a German translation. English. My paper got a poor grade. German. Um, it's impressive in some sense that this works at all given the language model wasn't trained um, for this sort of task per se, and I think that that's part of the reason why it's generated such an enormous amount of attention. Um, and so um, to recap how prompting works or the direction that it's going in, uh, you have a massive language model. Think of this as like a GPT. It's frozen. It's probably proprietary and probably behind an API. So you're interacting with this large language model, you're not touching it, none of its parameters are changing, you don't know what its hidden states are, it's, it's behind the API. Um, so, and then you're just changing the prompt. Um, so this is clearly what is needed for the commercialization of AI. Uh, proprietary models behind an API are likely to be lucrative uh, for the tech companies that develop these models. I mean, you can imagine, um, think about something like the Transformer, developed by researchers at Google. They publish it um, and they open source the code. Um, and you might ask, you know, like why, why was that ever the model to, to start with? I think as sort of as AI was moving from something that started out um, in academia as basic research in universities and it's going through this transition of being something developed by tech firms probably to attract the talent um, that could develop it further, you know, that was part of what made it appealing is to be able to publish your work and not just be some faceless person who designed something for Google, right? Um, but I'm, you know, 
I'm sure that, you know, some executives must have been saying, so why are we giving this away for free? Um, you know, whereas if you have a proprietary large language model and you put it behind an API, okay, good for business um, and good for the users because it doesn't require technical expertise necessarily. We'll see some ways of designing prompts that would require technical expertise. But for your typical user, um, they just go and type something in, seems intuitive, and get out an answer, right? So clearly, you know, this is clearly the direction <laughs> that this sector is going. Um, and you increasingly see arguments in this literature, you know, GPT is just too good to forgo. Um, you know, so we might as well just tune our prompts for GPT rather than kind of leave that on the table and use something smaller, of course. You know, I think some of the people making these claims probably um, have a, a lot to benefit from um, AI moving in this direction. So that's always a good thing to keep in mind when interpreting claims like this. So I'm skeptical that prompting of kind of the nature that you see it commonly advocated for works particularly well for many research tasks. You know, our tasks, first of all, might be really out of domain to what GPT was trained on compared to like movie reviews, given that there's lots and lots and lots of movie reviews and, you know, C4 in the corpus that these large language models were trained on. In fact, there's benchmark data sets in there. Um, and for um, a paper that, that I have, we looked at how well GPT-3 did on a benchmark using examples that were found as near duplicates in C4 versus ones that weren't, and it did much better on the examples that were there. So, you know, what we want to do is probably a lot different um, from what's in a lot of these benchmarks that this has maybe been tested on. Think about it, the benchmarks were disproportionately developed by companies to solve their commercial problems. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of reviews um, in the data that these large language models were trained on. So figuring out the sentiment of a review um, is just a different task than figuring out the sentiment of stuff that we might care about unless you happen to be working with reviews um, for your paper. I think kind of even more fundamental than that, um, when you fine tune a model, what are you doing? You're giving it fine grained, precise directions. These are carefully developed directions, ideally. You've thought carefully about what the definition of your problem is. You've made sure that that definition is coherent by doing congruence labeling, by giving multiple people the definition and making sure that they produce the same labels for your empirical examples. And then you're mathematically implementing that precise, careful, well thought out definition You know, by doing gradient descent and updating your model. Um, and like fine-grained, precise, carefully thought out measurement is essentially what doing science is. Um, you know, I think if you're doing that, you're doing science, you're developing a precise definition of what you want to measure, you're being very careful in implementing that. Um, whereas if you go and say, hey chat, like what's the sentiment of this text? Like that is not, <laughs> in my view, doing science. Um, it's interacting with the commercial product. Um, you know, you may need to interact with a product um, and that, that may be sufficient for some of your tasks, but I don't think that's doing science. You know, also, if the model is constantly changing or even more, if the future of this is that these models are all hooked up to the internet, so they're constantly changing in real time as more stuff goes on to the internet, um, what you did is also not reproducible, right? Which could potentially be an issue um, for doing science. Um, you know, in, in our experience, you get much better performance on tasks like sentiment or topic classification by fine tuning a pre-trained language model. So, I mean, I think it is like impressive that GPT-3 can do kind of, sort of decent um, on some of these tasks, like, but we still found that like you do much, much better um, by like fine tuning um, Roberta. And also that process is it's, it's helpful because you're precisely, again, you're precisely defining what you want the model to do and you're giving the model very precise instructions. 
Um, another big issue with this approach is that when we go to applications, you'll see lots and lots of applications where what we want is to work directly with the hidden representations, uh, the vector representations of a text that come out of a transformer language model. You know, so we have like a billion um, bounding boxes from historical newspaper articles, and we want to know which one of those come from the same source. Like you do not formulate that problem as a text prediction task. You push those through a transformer model that's been trained to do that task, and then you do clustering. Um, on the hidden representations. Whereas if your entire like transformer model is behind an API, or even if it's not behind an API, there are open source alternatives to GPT-3, like Facebook produced one called OPT-175 billion, which I think it's really amazing that they did that and they open sourced it despite maybe commercial incentives to the contrary, but still, like you can't tune that, like the representations are huge vectors, can't you, like, because you're not, T tuning the representations, um, like then all of those tasks are sort of out, you know. So I've said all of this um, in part because I am predicting with almost certainty, like a slew of like very bad papers in economics in the coming years, where people go to uh, GPT or some kind of future equivalent and ask it to to create their data for them without really thinking very carefully about whether their task is coherent without doing much validation and then saying, oh, I used high-tech AI to create this data set and, um, and it's just going to be nonsense. Um, and, but, you know, I think at the same time, there are really promising applications of this and we'll see some of them. Um, I think there are tasks for which it may work. And so it's something that you should be aware of and use when appropriate, but don't like, I don't think that you should see this as a substitute to having to learn how to fine tune a model or to doing kind of careful science. All right. So again, quoting from the recent review on this, it says, given a suite of appropriate prompts, a single language model trained in an entirely unsupervised fashion can be used to solve a great number of tasks. However, as with most conceptually enticing prospects, there is a catch. This method introduces the necessity for prompt engineering, finding the most appropriate prompt to allow a language model to solve the task at hand. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about now. Um, how, um, how is the literature thinking about engineering prompts? Um, and so this is an example of uh, prompts uh, for different tasks. Text classification, it could be sentiment classification, topic classification, etc. Text band classification, um, like here they're doing um, aspect sentiments. They wanna look at classification of a given span of text, um, like named entity recognition would be an example of that. Text pair classification, NLI, natural language inference is a common example of that. Uh, text generation, like summarization or translation, uh, textual similarity, etc. So there's a bunch of different kind of standard tasks. They give examples of templates to do these tasks. Um, in particular, um, prompts uh, tend to have two different shapes. You can have closed prompts. I love this class. It is a blank class or, or prefix prompts. I love this class. What's the sentiment of this review? Uh, prefix prompts are good for autoregressive language models um, because that's how they were trained, kind of predicting the next word. Closed prompts are a better fit for uh, mass language models um, because they were trained by predicting mass tokens. Um, so there's been a variety of efforts to create manual prompts, um, starting with the uh, LAMA data set in 2019. Um, you know, you can go to GPT chat and see a list of all sorts of prompts that they suggest for interacting with it. Um, the template design can also be automated, uh, learning discrete prompts. Um, by discrete prompts, I mean prompts that are text or continuous prompts, which are prompts described directly in the embedding space of the underlying language model. So there are a variety of approaches to discrete prompt engineering. Um, you could search for template tokens using downstream application training samples. Um, I think what uh, we're seeing more and more of is you treat prompt engineering as a, as a text generation task itself, and you reuse an autoregressive language model like GPT to generate prompts for you.
Um, and so um, another thing I wanted to mention was chain of thought prompting. Um, and so these models tend to be notoriously bad um, on certain types of problems, like math problems. Um, and so you see an example here, um, and you're giving it a problem and an example, and then you give it another similar problem and ask you to solve it. And it understands that you're looking for a number, um, but it just, you know, in the sense of like, this is a large language model, it's trained to predict the word that comes next. Um, it, it just, you know, any number is equally fine. Um, where the idea of chain of thought prompting is that you explain your chain of thought to it. Um, and the idea is that then you're sort of prompting it to explain its chain of thought to you and it's more likely to give the right answer. Um, and so in this paper, you know, fine tune GPT even does like pretty horribly on this um, uh, word problem benchmark. Um, and they're training a Google model called Palm, which is also very large with chain of thought prompting and show that they do much better. I mean, their solve rate is still not great, but it's um, you know sort of much better uh, than um, without the chain of thought prompting. And I think there's increasingly kind of this idea that um, by explaining reasoning uh, to the large language model, you're more likely to get it on a path um, that it will give um, the correct answer. Um, there's another really interesting recent paper, and I'm not going to go into any amount of depth in talking about this now. We'll maybe talk about it more when we get to the retrieval application. Um, but with kind of vanilla large language models, um, they have this common problem that they will, you know, the word used is hallucinate things. Um, and so basically, I mean, again, it's an autoregressive large language model is just trained to predict the next word, kind of taking a soft max over the vocabulary. Um, and so there's examples like you ask GPT chat, or you ask chat GPT um, to um, tell me the um, uh, most influential paper in computer vision in 2022. I understand you're looking for a paper in computer vision and it gives you a citation, uh, but it's a paper that doesn't exist, right? Um, and so it's just, it's learned to predict something that looks like a paper in this field, uh, but there is no such thing. Um, and so you see an example of this here, um, how many stories are in the castle David Gregory inherited? And it's saying something, you know, Castle Gregory has three stories. Um, so it's just, um, hallucinating a fictitious castle with a fictitious number of stories and there's nothing kind of in the training of the large language model that would make it not um, do that. Um, and then in the second line they use retrieval. So now um, we haven't talked in detail about retrieval yet but the idea is that you get a vector representation of the query and say you have a vector representation of every page on Wikipedia and you're retrieving the nearest page, and then you're looking for the answer in there with a reading comprehension model. And in this case, it retrieved the wrong page in the knowledge base, and so then it's just gonna give you a garbage answer, right, because it hasn't gone to the right page in the knowledge base that would be able to answer that. Um, and so what this paper does is combine a frozen language model and a frozen retriever model, but it's using the generative capacity of GPT-3, I believe, um, to break down this question into smaller questions. So the language model in the first pass breaks this down into a question, which castle did David Gregory inherit? And that's an easier thing for the retriever to understand and so the retriever now, um, the retrieval model gives you the correct answer. And then the language model takes the original question um, and that retrieved answer along with a prompt that's asking it to kind of summarize the context from that retrieved answer and break the question down into the next part. How many stories does um, this castle have? Um, and that's, again, an easier question for the retrieval model. And so it goes to the right page um, in the knowledge base, and it gives you the answer. And then you're going to kind of summarize and prepend that page 
onto the question, uh, onto the prompt that you give to the language model, and you've essentially given it the answer in the prompt, and so now it's going to correctly um, give you uh, the answer to that question. Um, but in all of this, you haven't trained, you haven't tuned the language model parameters, you haven't tuned the retrieval model parameters. It's just essentially using this sort of chain of thought prompting, um, where now you're breaking this down um, into kind of um, into easier things for the retriever to handle, and then you're adding that context, you know, the context of this logic into the um, the prompt for the language model, and it's more likely that you know it has essentially the information that it needs to complete um, this um, within the prompt. All right. Um, so. What about continuous prompt tuning? There was a paper called Prefix Tuning, Optimizing Continuous Prompts for Generation in 2021 that proposes to keep the pre-trained language model frozen but optimizes a small continuous task-specific vector, uh, which they call the prefix. Um, and so the language model parameters, they're all frozen. You backprop the air during tuning to prefix activations, and those prefix activations are prepended to each layer in the encoder stack, including the input layer. Um, so you're learning activations through each layer, and the paper argues that with 0.1% of the learned parameters compared to fine-tuning prefix, tuning on GPT-2 obtains comparable performance to fine-tuning when using full benchmark data sets, performs better in low data settings, and extrapolates better to cases with topics unseen during training. And so this is their architecture figure. So you can see that they add this learnable prefix to the beginning, um, and then they're back propping through that um, prefix um, and learning uh, parameters for it at every layer of the transformer. There is a paper around the same time that simplifies this approach by only allowing an additional k tunable tokens per downstream task to be prepended to the input text. And so in this case, you're not learning representations at each layer of the transformer. You're just learning a continuous prefix uh, to prepend to your input text. Um, this is uh, when you have learnable prompts, these are called soft prompts. And so this soft prompt is trained end to end. The paper argues that it can condense the information from a full label data set into a prompt, um, a continuous vector prompt. Um, and they show, um, using um, ablations on T5, that prompt tuning becomes more competitive with as the size of the language model scales. Um, and so again, here you see on the left um, model tuning, um, and here they're using um, the T5, the huge, um, with 11 billion parameters. Um, and a big part of the motivation for both this paper and the prefix tuning paper is like, well, uh, if you have a model with 11 billion parameters and then you adopt it to 10 different tasks, then you have to save 10 copies of the model and be able to serve 10 copies of the model. Um, whereas with prompt tuning, again, you have this one frozen language model, um, but you're learning these task prompts, um, and the task prompts have only 20,000 parameters each. Um, so they're really very, very small. Um, there is an interesting application of this sort of approach again around the same time as the original papers to image captioning uh, called um, few shot learning with frozen language models. Um, and so in image captioning, you have an image and you're, um, you have an image and you have paired captions with it and that's what the model is trained on. Um, and so here they freeze the language model, uh, but the vision encoder is going to be learnable. Um, and again, kind of at all layers of the transformer, so they're going to be back propping through the vision encoder um, and essentially using that to map um, these images into the same space as the frozen language model, um, which I think is a pretty cool approach. Um, and then at, at test time, use that to do things like visual question answering, a uh, few shot image classification, um, where you've not seen these categories before in training. So they do this by making up words for things the model would have seen um, and see how it does on that. 
And so what's the bottom line? Um, I think when I first saw Prefix Tuning, I was super excited by it. It seems like a way to leverage a very large language model that would be too costly to tune, um, yet still be able to have a fine-grained objective through supervised uh, gradient descent um, using empirical examples from our cases. And I, you know, I know other people who were super excited by this as well. Um, yet my sense is that you know, this paper is now going on a couple of years old. My sense is that discrete prompt engineering has received you know, much, much more attention. Um, continuous prompt tuning may be super important in the future to our sorts of applications. Um, but I haven't really seen it very widely used at present. You know, this paper being a certain, there's a, a few other papers in this genre, maybe more than a few, but in terms of things that are widely cited, I don't think there's like a huge number. Um, and so, you know, it may still be super important in the future. I haven't seen a lot of it in the present. Why? You know, this is all just a conjecture as I haven't personally tried it, but I think it's a combination of, you know, I've heard some people say it doesn't necessarily work as well more generally um, as, you know, might have been the case in the cases examined in the papers. Um, you still have to deal with a very large language model um, for it to maybe be competitive. Um, and, you know, that itself introduces hassle. Um, and I don't know about the ease of use of code bases, whereas, um, you know, the code base to, t to, to fine tune Roberta is very, very straightforward to work with. Um, and so I think maybe some combination of all these factors, maybe it still needs to be refined, the concept needs to be refined to get it to work kind of super well. And if it's not gonna be necessarily like much better than fine tuning a smaller model, you're going to have to deal with um, working with a very large language model, even though you're not training its parameters, um, and you're going to have to deal with a code base that maybe hasn't been as widely used. Yeah, you're probably just going to fine tune Roberta, um, and that's what I would um, probably suggest doing now. But I think that um, this continuous prompt tuning is definitely. Um, a space to watch um, because I do think it has the potential to have um, lots of relevant applications um, as the area develops. Um, all right, so that's all I have on this and I'm really excited to talk about this on Class Tuesday because I think it's a topic that could generate lots of interesting discussion, um, so I will see everybody then. Thanks.